Conference is being recorded. Welcome to TechSoup Talks. This is Cami Griffiths, and today's topic is using mobile technologies for outreach and education. I am joined by Michael Sabat and Adam Shayevitz. Shy- Shy- <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and um, I first want to just get started by saying a little bit about myself. I'm the training and outreach manager here, and we've been conducting webinars for about a year. And um, Adam, can you tell me, Adam's from Boston. Uh, after school and beyond, can you tell us a little bit um, about your program there? Sure. Boston After School and Beyond is the out of school time intermediary for Boston. That means we work with the city, local funders, and local uh, service providers to uh, expand uh, and improve the system of out of school time opportunities for youth, actually, uh, children K through 12 in the city of Boston. Excellent. Thank you. And we'll be hearing much, much more about Adam's program in a few minutes. And Michael, can you tell us, Michael's from uh, Mobile Commons, and can you tell us a little bit about that and your role there? Sure. So Mobile Commons is an online application um, that makes it easy for organizations to launch and manage mobile campaigns. And I am the community manager and kind of in charge of a lot of the customers there. And so over the past year or so, uh, launched and uh, helped promote many, many uh, mobile campaigns for nonprofits and uh, political organizations and advocacy groups, uh, organizations like that. Excellent, thanks. And for the for the folks out there, we are talking to Mobile Commons because Adam has been working with them through the course of his um, project. So we thought it was a nice tie-in to have um, them present as well. So I would like to quickly go over the agenda for today. This is an hour-long webinar, and we're going to first start talking about the basics of mobile technology and the, um, using mobile to provide services and to broadcast information. So we'll have uh, time to talk about each of those separately and what you should do to get started. And then there will be about 15 minutes for audience Q&A. But again, if you have any questions um, that you want to answer immediately, please do send those on the chat, through the chat. And the question and answer portion will all be questions that are taken through the chat. Uh, I also want to I'm going to go back here and thank Becky Wiegand, my coworker, for um, clicking away, answering questions on the chat, and also Laura Newton, who's volunteering for TechSoup. She uh, created the uh, webinar today. Actually, she did an amazing job of pulling all this information together. So I want to thank Laura for that. So I would like to get started with Michael. Uh, why is it important for nonprofits and libraries to start thinking about how they can use mobile technology? So. Um, from the stats you see here, uh, there's a lot of it going on. There's a lot of text messages being sent. Uh, pretty much everybody now has a mobile phone, and it's just going um, through all demographics and all age groups are starting to text. Um, so, so it's arrived you know, in that sense for a communication medium. Um, the things that make it a little different from email and from the other ways to communicate with constituents is, um, most importantly, there's no spam on text messaging, so, so people really pay attention here. Uh, everybody has their phone within five feet of them for most of the day, and when text messages come in, they look at them right away. It's an instant form of communi communication, so when you need people to take action right away, they will do it because they get it and they pay attention to it right away. And uh, you know that's the whole thing. People really pay attention to text messaging. Um, and, and kind of something that maybe a little more in the background, is it's uh, one of the best ways to communicate with both rich people and poor people. So uh, obviously mobile is very hot when we think about you know, iPhone apps and things like that, but, but I think something like a third of the U.S. doesn't have uh, broadband service regularly at home. So, so this is one of the best ways to get, communicate with those people, those underserved markets. Excellent. Thanks. And Adam? What factors made Boston After School and Beyond decide to undertake new mobile technology programs? Well, our goals are to uh, reach high school age youth with uh, program and public health information, and also to give those uh, same youth an opportunity to uh, describe their experiences and um, uh, to the broader public. And since we know generally that you know 80 percent of high school age youth across the country have cell phones, uh, this. This seemed like a uh, this seemed like a natural fit. Um, we couldn't imagine a, a, a more um, reliable way to uh, reach the target audience with this information. 
I, as we'll describe later, you know, we're, act, we're providing information through a pull system, so we're not going to be broadcasting any messages to these youth, but we are creating systems, or we hope to create systems, that will allow them to pull information off of uh, the Internet over their cell phones. Excellent. So now we're going to talk about the basics. So Michael, can you go over some of the basics for people who are new to mobile technology? Sure. So um, mobile is a little different. Uh, I, I spoke before about how there's no spam, and, and the reason that is is because the carriers really oversee uh, the messaging going on here. So just some of the terminology to start with. Um, there's what's known as a short code, and this is a five, sometimes a six-digit number, and very rarely a four-digit number. Um, and this is like a phone number for the use of text messaging for organizations. Um, and to do a campaign, you probably want to get a short code for the organization. And there's a, you can get your own. Uh, you can get a unique short code. You can get a random short code. Um, and you can get a vanity short code where you choose the number. Uh, but you're definitely going to want to go through a short code. Mobile Commons, for instance, and there's other companies like this, they provide a short code when you sign up with their service. Uh, we also, though, when someone texts in, we need to know what campaign they're talking to. And that's where the keyword comes in place. Um, so you text in a keyword to a short code, and that identifies um, for the provider, Mobile Commons in this case, what campaign you're talking to and tells us how to respond. So when you text in the name of someone when you're talking to American Idol, when you're voting on American Idol, that name you text in is the keyword, and you text that to a short code, a five-digit number. And there is a, an organization set up by the carriers uh, to manage these short codes and um, uh, kind of lease out the short codes. Uh, you can't buy them, but you can lease them, and, and they're rather expensive. But there's one branch of, there's one organization that leases these out and oversees them um, for organizations or providers like, like us to use. Uh, and there are a number of different campaigns that can happen over text messaging and over mobile. So the first one would be, and you can see the slide here, text alerts. So sending out, you know, up to, up to the minute um, or information, reminders, things like that. Um, text to data, this is more of a pool system where you can text in a query, for instance, and get an answer back. Um, if anybody's familiar with Google SMS, this is just a really, really big text to data system. Um, the next one, text to voice, because you're using a phone, you know, of course you want to incorporate voice into these programs if it makes sense. So you can text, uh, text out, you can push out a phone number to people, they can connect to that phone number, and you get them to take action and do a whole bunch of things, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, the fourth one down is called text to screen, and this is where people are texting in um, and their messages are appearing on a scoreboard or a jumbotron, um, something like that, usually at a live event. You can also push it to the internet so that um, people can text in whatever it is and you can moderate the messages in most cases and then display them. Uh, and then the last two there are MMS and video. MMS is kind of picture messages, that's the way to think about that. There aren't as many standards with MMS as there are with SMS, so um, the different carriers treat MMS differently. And so it, it's, not, it's not as smooth yet as, uh, as SMS, and it's also a little expensive. Same thing with video. This is kind of the wild west here with, with this stuff. So the usage just really isn't there yet, um, but it's, it's definitely coming very soon. Um, and then smartphone apps, you know, the iPhone apps, the BlackBerry apps, very cool stuff. Um, again, the usage really isn't there for smartphone apps. I think like probably 99% are on the iPhone, and uh, you know that's about I guess six percent of the market right now. I'm not sure. I know it's growing pretty quickly, um, but that's where we're at with with uh, the smartphone apps. It's just they're cool, but aren't for the public yet, or aren't for uh, you know the mass market, I should say. Um, and then for the sake of this, this demonstration, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about pool technologies and push technologies. And I'd say the major difference here is with pool technologies, the person, the user is texting in and getting an answer back. And, uh, and that's it. With push technologies, people text in and we get their permission to text them back when we want to. So similar to like an email campaign where we collect people's numbers, they opt in to receive future messages, 
and um, and then we can send out messages uh, to them when we when we want to. Excellent. Now uh, we're going to talk about the ways that nonprofits are using these technologies. So, Michael, can you tell us about some of the way, the types of programs using pull and push technologies that nonprofits can consider, or actually just pull technology that nonprofits can consider? Yeah. So so. Um, we have several people doing pull technologies. And just to review, that's someone texting in basically a query and they want to find information. So the way we work is we help the nonprofit expose their data and make that very simple. This example is, is probably one of our most well-known campaigns that we um, power. It's called the fish phone. And with the fish phone, a user can text in uh, the word fish and then the name of a fish, like tuna. And that looks it up in the fish phone's database and texts them back the health and environmental impact of eating that fish. And I know Adam's going to talk a lot more about this, but the, the benefits, what, what the fish phone used to be was a wallet card that people would carry around. So they could pull it out when they're at the grocery store and look at it and see, oh, I should not eat tuna, I should eat salmon, or whatever it says. Um, when you do that with text messaging, first of all, you reach, reach a wider audience because everybody has a cell phone and this really spreads word of mouth. Um, but just as importantly, you collect data on people. So what are people searching for? How often are they using this? Um, what are they searching for that we haven't researched yet? And so our clients in this case can, can knows where they want to research next. And then um, also, you know, when you take it to funders and say, look, this many people are now making decisions in the grocery store and we have proof of that. Or people are, you know, querying this when they're in the restaurant and now we have trackable proof. Um, and then the final benefit just to the text messaging is that uh, this is a story. The media does want to talk about this. So the fish phone has been written up in many, many newspapers, um, Parade Magazine, New York Times multiple times. And, uh, and then all over the Internet on blogs and things like that. So it's, it's really uh, helped transform that organization. Great example. And I know I had that piece of paper in my wallet too, but then you, you, know, you either don't have that wallet or you forget to use it. So. Yeah, and that's another Great. thing. You know, nobody wants to print anymore right now too. You know, that's, not, that's not in vogue. <laughs> right, we're trying to save the environment by not printing. Yeah. So we're going to continue to talk about pull technology. So Adam. I understand that Boston Baptist School and Beyond is developing some innovative programs using pull technologies to serve your youth constituencies. Can you tell us about your program? Sure. Uh, we are developing, really scoping out a three-part system. Uh, the first, and I, and I should say all of them, the first two that I'll describe uh, that take advantage of data that we or other partners already possess. So we're you know, developing the technology to deliver this content to cell phones, but uh, the content is really the most important part of it, and, uh, and that we've been developing for the past two years. Uh, the first system uh, relies on the bostonnavigator.org website, which is a, a comprehensive database of out-of-school time opportunities uh, for kids K-12 through in the Boston area. Uh, it's available to anyone on the webinar who wants to look at it, uh, just Boston Navigator. Org, and they share that middle end, as you can see on the slide. Uh, generally, what we want to be able to do is use a SMS interactive SMS interface that's uh, on the next slide. Um, and this is inspired by, by uh, work we originally saw out of uh, ISIS Inc. in San Francisco that runs a service called sexinfosf.org that uh, provides um, uh, sexual health information to users uh, using a similar system. So the system we've scoped out will use a five-digit short code, and users will text a keyword after school to that five-digit. Uh, I'm just pull up a little thing here. Hold on. Try to activate my pointer. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so they'll text after school to that five-digit short code, and receive a uh, menu with options. And I should say, all of this, uh, some of this interface is subject to change as we plan to focus group it uh, in the fall. But generally the way it will work is that a user will text in a local address, their age, and then there will be some way to indicate their area of interest, uh, you know, arts, sports, academics, music, etc. In response to sending uh, the message, they'll get a follow-up message listing two or three of uh, the programs closest to them, probably within a quarter or half a mile of whatever location they enter in uh, into the application. If you can advance to the next slide. 
we'll see that. So here's an example of what the users might uh, might receive if they reply with, for example, 31 Heath, uh, age 16, and interest code in this case was one. And, and you know, if uh, if I conducted the same search on Boston Navigator, this is what would have appeared. Uh, there happened to be some uh, opportunities at Diablo Glass Studio, and also the Neighborhood Network Television Program. So that's the first system to deliver program information to youth and youth workers. And I should say that you know our, our audience for this service uh, are both youth, high school age youth themselves, and the youth workers that uh, support them. You know, there are, Boston is fortunate to have a number of youth workers that that work on the streets, really, with disconnected and, and hard to serve youth. And we want them to have this information too, so that when uh, the youth that they are serving express an interest, they can respond with uh, information to that interest in real time, wherever they happen to be. So the next service, if you uh, click on it to the uh, next slide, is uh, a public health information system. Um, again, you know, using data that already exists either at bostonresourcenet.org uh, or some other partners that we're working with at the Boston Public Health uh, Commission, we'll be putting a, a wide range of public health information uh, online or I should say on mobile using a similar interface. So if we can advance to the next slide. and, and I can't uh, control that slide progression, can I? Yeah, you can. Okay. okay. So um, again, here users would text youth to that same five-digit shortcode, uh, and they would get a, uh, a message similar to the one here. Again, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, testing this to make sure that it's the right kind of interface to use with youth. But in general, the system will, again, ask people uh, probably to text in their zip code rather than their exact location. We don't want to scare people away by giving them the impression that we're tracking their address. Uh, but again, they'll text in their zip code, their, their age, and then a question code or some other, they'll have some other way to indicate uh, their area of interest. Now I should say that we're exploring two systems. One is this text to a data system to deliver the information. The other is a text to person system. Uh, you know, it's unclear whether youth and youth workers are more likely to use a text to data system or a or a text to a person system, almost like a call center, you know, an, an SMS-based uh, distributed call center. And in that example, uh, a youth would access the system again, you know, using a keyword and a five-digit shortcode. They would get back a message, something like this, you know, ask your confidential question about school, sex, parenting, drugs, violence, anxiety, etc. And then a cadre of volunteer experts certified in different uh, content areas would respond within four hours. So in this case, the example here is someone texts in uh, drug, drug rehab in JP, which is short for Jamaica Plain, a, a neighborhood in Boston. And uh, they might get back a message like this within you know, a pretty short order. Uh, it will be encouraging. It will be personal. It'll, it will list uh, the local resources. Um, and it may ask, you know, the person may ask a clarifying question if they need to in order to respond well to, to whoever is submitting the question. Uh, we'll determine which of these two systems to pursue, you know, text to data or text to person, after focus grouping the options, uh, hopefully in the fall. The third system that we are scoping out is a, it's a way for youth to communicate with each other and with the city generally about uh, their lives, their experiences, their interests. We, you know, if you think about a Twitter feed, for those of you familiar with Twitter, uh, it would work in a similar way that there would be a, uh, again, a five-digit shortcode that youth could send messages to. And um, one of the models we're looking at is something called Ushahidi, which was developed originally in Kenya to uh, track uh, voter intimidation at, uh, at Kenyan polling places. It's been used since in a number of other countries to do what's called crisis, I'm sorry, a crowdsourced crisis reporting. This latest example on the, on the screenshot here is from India, where uh, Ushahidi was used uh, to describe events around polling places in India. We have in mind something similar, but um, in order to give the youth participating a uh, clearer framework uh, for how to communicate with the system, we're exploring uh, with various partners uh, things like SMS text poetry, uh, SMS storytelling uh, programs, that would give us an opportunity to engage youth in a literacy project and a creative project as well as an informational project. Uh, you know, we're, we want to make sure that youth who participate in this uh, system you know, enter information that will be meaningful to them uh, but not uh, 
put them in any danger or report on incidences or events that uh, may draw the attention of the police. Um, you know, if, if, if such communication is necessary, we hope they continue to use 911. But uh, for our purposes, we really want to give youth a creative outlet, a way for them to, you know, let the broader city know about their lives and their experiences. So this uh, third part of the system is probably the one that's uh, least developed at this stage, um, but our partners are well engaged and very excited about where it may go. Very good. So that was uh, poll technology. Those are some great examples. And now we're going to move on and talk about push technology. So Michael, can you tell us about how some of the nonprofit organizations you work with have used mobile technologies to push or broadcast messages and the kind of results that they've achieved? Sure. Um, and I'm sure Adam would agree with this. And like anything in life, uh, you want to balance. So some of these people have push technologies and pull technologies. Um, I think there's a lot of value in both uh, from an organizational standpoint. Um, you know, acquiring that list and being able to message that list when you need to is, is pretty important for a lot of our customers and, you know, one of the most valuable things there. So I'm just going to go through a lot of examples of uh, people, what people do. So the first one, we're looking at a picture right now with, uh, with HRC, the Human Rights Campaign. Um, they build their list, whether it's um, people signing up online, people texting in at live events. Um, they can also, you know, have people on the ground writing down phone numbers. And, and the important thing here is that people have to opt in to receive messages, so they have to know that they're going to receive uh, text messages from the organization. But um, there's a lot of best practices available and a lot of, you know, advice that we give our clients on how to do this. And, you know, they build fairly sizable lists. So some examples of some really good push campaigns. Uh, the biggest one that, you know, probably everybody knows about is for get out the vote for the elections. And um, many, many, many organizations did this, uh, including Barack Obama, obviously. And that's why he, he wanted to build that list of people texting in to find out who the vice president was, um, to be the first people to find out who the vice president was, so that he could remind them to go vote. And the reason he was doing that, in, in 2006, we powered a study by the University of Michigan and Princeton um, that showed the power of text messaging to get people to show up to the polls. And the, the quick summary is that um, when you send somebody a text message to remember to vote on the day before or the day of the election, they're about 4.5% um, more likely to vote, or that increases voter turnout by about 4.5%, and uh, just a simple text message. And the real interesting part was um, at a level of, I think the, the stat is about $1.50 per additional vote. And when you compare that to all the other methods, whether it's um, direct mail, leafletting, email, um, text message was by far the cheapest way to do this. Uh, so canvassing uh, increased the vote by about 6%, I think, uh, but at a price of like $20 an additional vote. Um, emailing was about the same, but you know, in terms of how it increased the turnout, but again, it costs a lot more than, than text messaging. Um, one other very quick, uh, example of a push technology is someone like Do Something. And I don't know if people are familiar with them, but you can text in to Do Something, you text in your zip code, and they will reply with volunteering opportunities in your area. Um, and they're focused on getting youth uh, involved in the communities. And, um, and again, just letting them know instantly about opportunities, the way that they talk, uh, the way that they communicate, um, works very, very well for them, and they're growing very quickly. Um, Another thing that you know, was kind of in the summary is text to voice. So this is great for a few things. Um, the first one is advocacy. Um, so if you think about it, you have a list of you know, people that want to hear from you. You send them a text message with a phone number in it. They can connect to that phone number. They can hear talking points, which you create and record. And then they can be forwarded on to their congressperson, their governor, um, you know, really any any public official or anyone that you want them to talk to. They can be forwarded on anywhere. And then we can track those actions. So some of Mobile Commons clients, you know, everybody, this is a very valuable tool for a lot of our clients, um, but people are placing, you know, 75,000 plus calls a month uh, to elected officials on specific issues, and we can track that. And then we can also know that the people knew what to talk about with their officials because they heard a recording um, directly before they connected. Uh, 
And then another thing an organization did, which was really cool, was during Hurricane Ike, uh, there were a bunch of rescuers, and they would send out to these people going down into Texas, uh, they would send out conference call information with text message, which makes a lot of sense because there's not a lot of internet and it, there's really no way, good way to communicate, but a simple text message that says, hey, call into a conference call line in 15 minutes was a great way for them to organize. Um, another kind of push technology, and, and this kind of is in, in, uh, in between here, but text to screen. And this is really great for live events. In this example right here, you can see that this was surrounding healthcare. And an organization called It's Our Healthcare set up a jumbotron outside of the California um, Capitol building, and people could text in their opinions on healthcare. And this was at a rally, and people were texting in whatever they wanted to say, and the jumbotron was pointing towards uh, the Capitol building, and you know the legislators, the lawmakers could could read it. Uh, but, but also this was simulcast on the web, and so people could watch it and text in from anywhere in the state. They didn't have to be at the rally. And then the obvious thing to do once somebody starts interacting here is say, hey, can we give you future updates on healthcare in California in this case? Text back this keyword if you'd like to receive future updates and opt in. Um, and then one more quick example of text to screen is uh, – the California Democratic Party uh, was set up outside of a Sarah Palin rally and had people text in questions for Sarah Palin. And this was back in October, uh, you know, when the whole Katie Couric and all the interviews were going on. So people were texting in questions. She wasn't answering them, but it was a huge uh, billboard at the rally. And the same thing, they put it on the internet and um, people were text started texting in from all over the country. They really built their list on that day because it, it got on a bunch of blogs and, and it was simulcast in a few places. And it's still up in a recorded version on Tech President. Um, if anybody wanted to check that out, I'm sure you can search for it there. Great example. And just to remind everybody that we will be following up this webinar with an email with a link to the recording and all the URLs that we've been talking about today copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So um, we'll be including all of the um, websites that Michael and Adam have mentioned. So I want to move on. We've talked about push technologies, pull technologies, heard some great examples, but now let's talk about getting started. Michael, what are the first steps for a nonprofit that wants to get started using mobile technology? Sure. So the first thing is um, to set goals, obviously, with any project you're going to want to do that. And a good way to frame this is that uh, Mobile should be integrated in your entire communication strategy. What it's really going to do for you is it's going to increase um, the open rates on emails, uh, the click-throughs on emails, you know, take it, people taking action from emails. Um, it's going to help your list building from live events, things like that. So you should really look at it as an integrated part of your communication strategy, not something that's standalone. Um, that really didn't work uh, for anybody. Uh, the next thing is you're going, to have, you're going to need some partners in how you do this. And mobile is quite confusing, so you probably want to find somebody to explain it to you, and I'm happy to do that if people uh, would like that. But here's a, here's a quick breakdown of kind of the level of vendors. So, and there were a lot of questions about short codes too in the chat. So, um, and you don't have to do this, but this is one way to do this. At the highest level, the kind of the most intense and probably the most work is getting your own short code. Uh, getting it hosted with what's known as an aggregator, and that's um, at the top of the line vendor. And an aggregator has a direct connection with the carriers. They'll take your short code, host it for you, and then you will need a system that you build or that you get somewhere else to talk to the aggregator and let them know what messages to send, to what phone numbers, and then if you'd like to receive those messages. Um, and that's the highest level. And short code prices are, um, for a random short code, it's $500. Uh, for a short code that you pick yourself, it's $1,000 a month. So a lot of, there were a few questions about that, so I figured I'd answer. Um, and that's, that's at the most intense level. We have some customers that have their own short code. Most people use a shared short code. And when you start talking about shared short codes, that's probably the second level here, I say a management service. Um, and Mobile Commons, in this case, is, would be a management service. We have the short code. You can use one of our short codes. 
um, which is probably recommended, and I'm sure Adam would agree with that too. Um, so you don't have to pay for your own. We uh, handle everything with the carriers, everything with the aggregator, and um, you log into a system like Mobile Commons uh, that allows you to send messages and, and look at the messages you've received and manage these campaigns ra rather easily. And with this, there's going to be a monthly fee and probably a uh, per message cost as well. Um, below that is a messaging service. And with a messaging service, you're, really, you're not paying so much for the management of messages, but you're paying to send messages. Uh, so that you would be managing these lists yourself most likely. Um, you would be opting people in, collecting the numbers yourself, and you're probably mostly paying just to send the messages somewhere. We have prices coming up, but you know, pennies or 10 cents at most uh, to send out a text message. But the data and the system integration really isn't there um, as far as I know. And then the fourth level down is a marketing service. And with this, you can probably send your text messages. They won't charge you, but they'll tack on a little um, advertisement at the end of the text message. Uh, and, and that, you know, depending on the organization, that may be okay and may not be okay. Um, those are the levels. And then the shortcut options, I talked about them a little, but a vanity short code, you choose your own. It costs $1,000 a month to lease. A random short code, um, you can choose your own, uh, or I'm sorry, you don't choose the number, but it's yours only, and that's $500 a month. And then a shared short code uh, would be probably provided by a, by a management service. Excellent overview. Now we're going to move to Adam, who's actually gone through this from the nonprofit's point of view, um, from idea to you know, from moving through all the ins and outs. So what considerations did you like look at when getting started? Well, the first thing uh, really was just I, I couldn't agree more that you know a goal is uh, wrapping this service around a goal is really important. You know, so we specifically wanted to communicate with high school age youth around these program and public health opportunities, and we wanted to create a way for youth to have their voice heard uh, by the city at large. So once we had our, you know articulated those goals, it was relatively easy to figure out uh, which technologies were most appropriate. Uh, that said, you know, we had to do a lot of reading, or I had to do a lot of reading and figure out uh, the different kinds of vendors and um, what services they offered and, and get comfortable with how they priced out their services and, and what we had to expect to buy. Um, so uh, before I get to that, because I know we're going to get to the cost stuff in a different slide, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about these, the automated systems and staff systems choices we were looking at. Um, you know, I saw in the uh, in the chat that's accompanying this webinar that someone asked, you know, are these staff systems easier in places that don't already have databases developed? And I think, you know, if you're, for those, for folks listening who are thinking about any one of these systems, um, I don't think there's any easy way to uh, provide quality content. You know, you're either, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of an automated system is that you can pull data from existing sources perhaps, maybe information that's already been vetted for quality, uh, and that's fine, but you still have to maintain that quality over time. And a, you know, we expect a lot of staff time involved in making sure that we're providing the right information uh, to the right folks in a way that is actionable and usable. And, and most importantly, connects those youth to caring and well-trained adults. The staff systems are, uh, you know, the advantages to them are that um, they're a little more personable. You know, you don't have to depend on the computer to communicate warmth and caring. Uh, to the user, um, but with staff systems, quality control becomes becomes an issue. Uh, you know, people, while they may be warm and caring, are never as predictable in their responses as a computer. And we want to take great care to make sure that the people answering questions that come in are doing so in a way that at least won't do any harm. You know, they that won't uh, turn youth away from services or turn them off from services that they may really benefit from. So in some ways, the technology behind any of these uh, systems is the easy part. The harder part is making sure that you're delivering uh, content that's accurate, at least for our, given our goals. The harder part is making sure that we're delivering information that's actionable, that is youth appropriate, um, and, and again, you know, won't turn anyone away or won't turn anyone off. Um, the other thing that we're always aware of is that you know, though SMS messaging is relatively inexpensive, we don't know enough yet about the uh, costs that users may incur per text message. 
we know in general that teens, we think we know that uh, teens are trending towards um, contracts or cell phone contracts that have unlimited texting, but we don't know that for sure. And you know, these messages for the user can cost up to 15 cents uh, per message, incoming or outgoing. We want to make sure that we're not adding to uh, what we understand anecdotally to be a problem of cell phone debt that youth or their parents are uh, getting into. Um, there's a line here about advertising costs. You know, we are considering uh, including advertising in our messages to offset the cost of the system, but we'll, we'd only do that once the system had proven, you know, a user base had uh, demonstrated interest in the system and we had enough volume to, you know, to warrant it. Um, here's this, you know, some item, some item here about opt-in. Uh, Michael, are you going to cover this around push technologies? Sure. Um, so. I kind of went over this before, but yes. Uh, let me talk a little about cost, which you just mentioned, Adam. Um, so, so yeah, it can be up to as much as 20 cents per message, uh, both ways, going, you know, sending from the cell phone and, and coming into the cell phone. But I think the thing to keep in mind is uh, your organization probably is not going to be the first uh, person that this that the user texts. Meaning, like they'll text their mom or their girlfriend or boyfriend first. Um, and, and, and so people self-select to participate in the texting. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. And, and at the same time, we don't know this for a fact, but it seems that uh, more people are getting uh, bulk rate plans. Um, but, but with the push technologies, the big thing is getting people to opt in. Um, with mobile, uh, with text messaging, these will not be ignored. Um, these don't sit around for two days and then just get archived. So the good part about that is people will see them and respond. The bad part is if they really didn't give you permission to text them and you kind of crossed a line or you're not, um, they're not worthwhile messages, people will just opt out and they'll get off the list. Um, so just something to keep in mind there. Um, you want strong opt-ins. You want strong lists. It's definitely a quality game, not a quantity game. Um, but these people will self-select, and these people will be your biggest fans. Um, and it's it's a really strong way to communicate with them with pushing out messages. Great. Thanks for the clarification. Now we want to deep uh, dig in a little deeper on cost. So Adam, based on the research that you've done, what kind of cost can someone looking at doing a mobile program expect to see? Yeah. So for the volume of a system that we're scoping out, which uh, you know we're thinking about 5,000 messages a month, more or less, uh, the bottom line is that the costs that you can expect to incur are between $17 and $20,000 a year. Uh, you can go cheaper, but um, I think those cheaper systems are likely to involve much more uh, demands of the, you know, the buyer. You know, you'll have to uh, have a more technical savvy and, and uh, be more willing to do more of the back-end work yourself. The, uh, the thing that folks should look out for is that uh, the vendors in this um, sector price their work very differently. You know, some have uh, relatively large upfront one-time licensing fees for their software. Others have uh, others, you know, push the cost into monthly uh, service contracts. Uh, among the vendors that that we've surveyed and, and we've talked to six so far, um, the costs all average out to around between seventeen and twenty thousand dollars a year. Um, but they the vendors break their costs out differently. So. When folks are uh, considering different vendors of their own, um, just be clear you understand where those cost centers are. You know, if it's going to be a big one-time upfront cost, which you know the benefit of that is that in your second, third, fourth year of the system, your cost should go down. Uh, you know, after that first uh, big payment's made, um, of course you need that original budget. You know, to to support that original one-time uh, platform licensing fee. Um, but generally speaking, again, you know, folks keep seventeen and twenty thousand dollars in mind for the technology side of the system. They should be okay. Um, when we were building our own budget for this program, uh, we had to put a lot of money. Uh, we put a lot of money into marketing, uh, or say into that line item. You know, again, because we're we're going to be looking at serving high school age youth, and anecdotally, again, there hasn't been a lot of research on this, but anecdotally, we understand that youth are more likely to use these systems when they are reminded of their existence on a regular basis. So we plan to take out uh, ads on MySpace and uh, Facebook, but also at the subway stations, uh, the bus stations in Boston, in the schools, uh, in the health centers, at gymnasiums, you know, wherever we can think of to put either print or electronic advertising. 
So the budget for marketing is going to probably exceed that for the technology itself. Uh, you know, we certainly hope to get as much of the print material donated or uh, provided as an in-kind service, but um, it'll still be expensive. Whether it's a cash, whether we pay for it out of out of pocket, or whether uh, folks you know provide it for free. Um, let's see. I think that, and and that's I think that's about it on costs. Of course, if anyone has questions, please add them to the to the chat, and I'll uh, do my best to answer them. Um, as the webinar continues. Okay, so I'd like to take this time. We do have a slide of resources, which I will talk about in a second. I do want to start answering some of the great questions that have come through the chat. So what I'm going to do is read off a question, and then Adam and Michael, you can decide who is best to answer it. So um, one person, John Jacobson, asked, will you be recommending sites for sending free text messages to multiple uh, mobile phones via phone book? Um, I think uh, for that, for info, does that sound right, Adam? I think yeah, for that's the that's the vendor that we've uh, we've been in touch with when we consider that model. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe they do attach. I, I believe it's free messaging, and they attach um, an advertisement to the back of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm guessing they have a paid model as well, where you can send messages without an advertisement. I don't know at what price level that would be, but but that when I went through the list of vendors, that is. Um, the, probably the biggest, one of the biggest in terms of, of doing that for, for organizations. And can you repeat the name again? Uh, for info, and it's the number four and then the word info. Great. And they're big. I mean, they're definitely the first hit in Google if you Google it. Another person is concerned about using this um, and the considerations for individuals with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Are there special tools for folks like that? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I don't know of any, and, and certainly um, we have in mind the broad base of cell phone users. So if a disability was getting in the way of a person's ability to use a cell phone uh, at all, then uh, it's frankly it, it, I just don't know of any ways to, to get around that. But uh, that being said, you know, we, we do hope uh, that there may be uh, text-to-speech applications on some phones that will allow people to you know, have the phone read back a message that comes in. Um, but other, that's all I'm familiar with. Michael? Yeah, I can't. I, um, nothing comes to mind uh, right now. Okay. Another question from Lorena. We are interested in using text for donation and also sending out real-time info during disasters to guide people. Any advice? Yeah, uh, something that we really didn't touch on, uh, I guess I skipped over it. But, uh, so mobile giving is also now in the universe of, of mobile, and that means that um, someone can text message a keyword, uh, and that counts as a $5 donation, which phone bill. And this is all done by the Mobile Giving Foundation. Uh, they handle the transaction. They, there's an application process for which they oversee, and they handle remittance of the payment. Um, they pass to the nonprofit. You have to be a 501c3. Um, you have to be, have been in existence for at least a year with an operating budget or annual revenues in the previous year of at least half a million dollars. Um, and they pass through 100% of the donation. So it works great in certain situations. Um, it's definitely not like an ATM. Um, you still need to give people a reason to donate in order for them to text in and donate to you, but it makes donating over the cell phone, well, it makes donating in general um, very simple and painless. Um, there's no credit cards, no checkbooks, no cash, and, uh, and then you know, a mobile bill, it's $5 on your mobile bill, which is you know, a mobile bill is very hard to read anyways. Um, the Mobile Giving Foundation, they're on the web, uh, mobilegiving.org. They require that you use um, what's known as an ASP, um, an Application Service Provider, and there are a few of them. Mobile Commons is one of them, and, and I have a lot of experience with that, so I'm happy to dig into more questions there uh, offline. Maybe if, if people want to email me or if, it, if everybody wants to know, we can talk about it. Um, Adam, do you have any experience with mobile giving, or have you heard about any programs there? I don't. I mean, we. You know, the only thing I read is that uh, it, it has not raised a tremendous amount of money, except in very specific circumstances. You know, as a as a broad-based um, fundraising campaign, it can certainly augment uh, a fundraising strategy, but it's unlikely, as, as far as I read at least, to become a, a core part of any organization's um, fundraising strategy. Yeah. It's more about fundraising marketing in a way. You know, you. You do a little marketing about your organization, and some folks uh, make a donation in return. 
Yeah, like anything. Um, yeah, so, so this, there's limitations. There's some good stuff and some not so good stuff. Uh, the limitation is uh, really that we can only collect $5 from people uh, right now and uh, at a time. They can do it five times per month, but each donation is $5. And then um, you cannot follow up with the people, so you can't collect any information once someone donates um, right now. Hopefully that will change. But um, so, so yeah, it becomes a question like, uh, do we want them to donate $5 or give their email address? And, and you know, that, that all depends on the organization. But some people have had success with it. It works great when you can um, get up, when Bono will get up at a concert and say everybody takes that, take out your cell phones and, and text message um, in. Or when, uh, you know, American Idol, that was the most successful campaign so far, I believe. Um, Alicia Keys did it on American Idol, and it, it worked very well when you have that type of reach. Great example. And that will be hopefully a future webinar that we offer is more focused on the fundraising aspect of mobile. Uh, so Rob had a question about organizations that have already started using these technologies as part of their mission. And do they see people actually using the service or has it not really caught on yet? So if you could give us, um, either of you, some examples of organizations that have used it and what the response has been. Uh, this is Adam. You know, we were originally inspired to pursue this specific uh, track because of the work that ISIS Inc. has done in San Francisco and other cities uh, regarding uh, sexual health information for teenagers. We have not gotten, uh, the, as far as I know, there's been no long-term research done on how well the system has been utilized. What we do know is that uh, the usage of the system is really uh, correlated to the marketing that the organization is doing. You know, when the marketing is out there, the system gets used. Um, as the marketing falls off, use of the system falls off. I think it's going to take a long time, uh, you know, assuming we get our system built and running. Uh, it's going to take a long time for it to enter the kind of the public consciousness of high schoolers in Boston. You know, we, we expect to, to have to do a lot of aggressive marketing for a long time to keep to keep up the usage. Yeah, and, and one thing, and Adam, you'll find this out um, if you don't know already, but uh, one thing that works great is like really engaging the users. And high school students will do it if you engage them and, and tell them about it. Um, what doesn't, what at least we found like mixed results with mobile is like uh, just a, a call to action written on a piece of paper. Um, it always helps if you can have someone tell them, hey, take out your cell phones, text this word into this number. And that seems obvious, but, but again, like you have to tell people to do it. You have to give them a reason to do it. And then it will work um, and most, you know, because it's the only device they have on them at, a, at an assembly in school or at a concert or something like that. Um, so it's important to do really engaging call to action. That's the most critical part um, and definitely not a high tech thing. It's, it's just a, a communications. It's a people thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that we're going to be doing in Boston uh, to generate that interest among uh, youth and youth workers is engaging them heavily in the ultimate design of the system. You know, and just to be clear, you know, we've scoped out the system here in Boston and we've enlisted the partners that we'll need to build it, but we're still waiting on our uh, funding proposals to get a yay or a nay. Um, but assuming you know, funding, uh, funding allowing, we're going to launch this focus group process in the fall. And a part of that process is certainly to help us refine the, the interface and make sure that we're, we're, um, we're doing it, we're building a system that youth will enjoy using. But the other part of the, pro uh, the other reason we're doing it is to engage a, a cohort of pilot users that will start the system up with us and will be most likely to use it in its first few months, uh, tell their friends about it, and, and then of course provide us with ongoing feedback about how well the system is working for them. And I think this next, next question ties in nicely. Uh, John had a question. To send a text message from PC to mobile, you have to have their cell phone number or the, the person's cell phone carrier. What's the best way to gather that information? So I, I'm guessing John, I just answered him on chat. I'm guessing John is talking about using an email gateway, which is something like uh, if you text messaged uh, number like one two three four five six seven eight nine one at vtext.com, you can send them a text message kind of through your email. I mean, that's, that's what I'm guessing. Uh, that, that's, that goes around the short code system. Um, I don't know how much the carriers like that. Like I've heard they really don't like that because I don't think they make um, money on that text message being sent. Um, the carriers do provide information. There's what's known as a carrier lookup. 
I think that has to be done with an aggregator. Um, and there's a small charge for it. It's about a half a penny to look up a phone number, what carrier that is. But, but I'm not sure in terms of infrastructure to do that, like what type of system would need to do that. If you go to a provider that has a, um, you know, a, like a management system, like we automatically look up that information when someone texts in. I'm guessing most providers do. I just don't know. And you don't need to know the carrier, I don't think, if you go with someone like 4Info um, that's, you know, just sending messages uh, for you. Um, they should be able to take care of that for you. Adam, can I jump in on a question I just saw coming on chat that I think it's really important? Definitely. Um, someone asked a question of you know if they only have one to five thousand dollars in their budget, uh, is text just not for them? And um, you know I, the seventeen and twenty thousand dollar cost that I described is it really reflects our plans, you know our our volume expectations, et cetera. But there are simple ways to use mobile technology that are far cheaper. Um, you know one of the Greatest stories I heard was reported in the New York Times a few months ago. It was a, a place called, uh, or service rather, called the Birds and Bees Hotline in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And the way uh, they work it, I think they have about a $5,000 budget. Um, they put some advertising in MySpace, and uh, I, I think just MySpace actually, and just said, look, here's a cell phone number. If you have a question about sex or sexual health, call. I'm um, sorry, send us a text, and we'll text you back. And uh, and it works. You know, uh, youth. You know, they were able to direct their advertising dollars to uh, youth exclusively in the Raleigh-Durham area, and uh, youth text the messages. And you know, they just went to their local mobile phone carrier, or whichever I don't know which one they chose, and uh, they bought a cell phone, or they rent. You know, they they, they got a cell phone contract uh, with unlimited texting. And the staff of the organization just take turns carrying this phone in their pocket, and when a text message comes in, they answer it. So you know, it was a very inexpensive way to deliver very personal, real-time information to youth. And you know, frankly, we'd look into a very similar system if we didn't want to cover a whole, except that we want to cover a whole range of public health issues, and we have a much larger uh, youth population. But but they had a very elegant solution, uh, very low budget. Um, you know, I think for what we're talking about, you know, which is a a, a pull system. Uh, that requires a, a service, uh, you know, a provider uh, like Mobile Commons. Although, you know, to be clear, we haven't contracted with Mobile Commons. They're here because they've been very, very generous in helping us understand the options. Um, but again, you know, we'll have to contract with somebody like Mobile Commons. We'll, we have to, you know, uh, we have to figure out how to get our data into the system, either by hosting it on our computers or dumping it into our vendors' computers. Uh, so that's going to cost about seventeen and twenty thousand. But there's definitely cheaper ways to do it. And the Birds and Bees hotline is a great example. And Michael, did you have anything to add to that? No, I would add, um, yeah, it all depends on what you want to build. You know, collecting email addresses from, you know, if you have an opportunity to do PSAs or something on the radio and you want to collect uh, people opting in and giving their email address, that can probably done, be done for cheaper um, than than the prices Adam is talking about. You know, it all depends, and there's a lot that goes into that. And then the other thing is, it makes sense to start collecting mobile numbers now, like no matter what your organization is doing. Um, when people sign up, have them sign up if they want to receive text messages, give us your number. And um, that, you know, the list will get weaker. If you text message someone six months after they sign up, they're going to be like, who is this? Um, why are they texting me? But at least uh, you can prove out for your bosses and your funders, um, look, people want to receive text messages. So um, making that an option to at least start collecting those numbers makes sense like tomorrow, no matter what your plans are. That's a really good point. Uh, David uh, Hackett says, what about Tatango? It's a free ad-supported SMS to a group. Have you guys used that service? No, I've, I've never heard of them. I mean, I'm sure there's probably like 30 or 40 of them out there. Um, I don't know much about them. You know, if, if you're willing to uh, be able to send messages with ads, you know, there's going to be people that are able to do it. And um, I know 4Info is, is probably one of the biggest in that space. I've never talked with them or met them, but I've heard about them. Um, and so you just probably if you want that, you want to go with a reliable source. So, uh, yeah, I, I would check it out and just do some diligence on them. Well, it's about time to wrap it up. It's already been an hour. 
these always go by so quickly, but here's the list of resources. We will be sending out a follow-up email with the URLs to each of these each of these organizations, and as well as the a plethora of links that we talked about during the presentation that have come up. If you have additional questions, I think we answered most every question that came through. But if you do have more questions, please do post them to our community forum. There's a, a tiny URL here, and Becky will be sending that via the chat. If you do have additional questions, please post them there. For those of you who are new to TechSoup, we do have much, much more than just webinars. We have donated software like Microsoft, Adobe, and Semantic. We have a community forum, so if you have questions of any sort, please post them to our community forums. And we have volunteers all over the world answering those questions. And we post upcoming events and conferences on our website, as well as uh, pertinent articles that are posted on a monthly basis, or uh, actually more than, more than one a month. And we'd like to thank ReadyTalk. They are sponsoring this webinar series and allowing us to offer these webinars for free. So if you're interested in learning more about ReadyTalk, they have a special, uh, special training just for TechSoup uh, participants. And lastly, I'd like to thank everyone for participating today, especially the presenters and Becky and Laura. And if you could take a minute to complete the post-event survey that you'll get a link to when we're completed. And if you have any questions or um, want to be in touch, my contact information is at the bottom. And again, this is TechSoup Talks, and I'm Cami Griffiths, and I'm really appreciating everyone attending the webinar today. And thanks, Michael and Adam. Have a great day, everyone. Sure, thank, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.